Gosling from Colorado, Colorado State University on the asymptotics of orthogonal polynomials ensemble via integrable methods. Turn on the mic. <laughs> okay, can you hear me? Thank you, Marco. Um, and I'd like to thank the organizers, Andrei, Sasha, Tamara, Alice, and Sergei. Thank you very much for inviting me. Beautiful place, a lot of great friends, so thanks. Um, so I, could, I couldn't actually uh, decide what, I, I'm not working in this exact area right now. And, and so I wasn't sure what to talk about, but then I decided I would talk about uh, orthogonal polynomial ensembles and their asymptotics via integrable methods, um, mostly because of Sasha's lectures on determinantal point processes, and this is sort of the integrable connection to that. Um, this is a review of, of uh, kind of old work of Jinho Bake, Thomas Kriegerbauer, myself, and Peter Miller. Um, but there's, um, well, maybe interesting reasons to, to to reconsider this work, okay? Um, but it is, it is supposed to be introductory, and so ask questions if you, if you have any. Um, and I'll try to keep a monotone so that you can, if you wish, sleep, okay? <laughs> so at the top of the screen is the uh, orthogonal polynomial of degree j. Um, the coefficients are disgusting, but, you know, the leading coefficient kappa jj is positive, and they all depend upon a parameter n, and so there's usually the superscript n floating around. Sometimes that will be there, and sometimes I will have forgotten to, to LaTeX it. Um, and then the orthogonality is uh, um, today, in the next, for the next 45 minutes, it will either be on the real axis um, or it will be on a discrete set, okay? And so these points are called the nodes. And there are n nodes, and they start at index 0 and go through index n minus 1. And if you're on a discrete set, then the orthogonality condition is this condition here. So that is really an integral, but it's a discrete sum instead of an integral, OK? And I see the first, let's see. This should be m. That letter should be m. My apologies. <laughs> I think the first two slides had <laughs> no typos. Um, yeah, right. But I did say that sometimes that wouldn't appear. So, yeah, okay. Um, and the interest is, is in uh, studying the behavior of these polynomials when degree n and parameter capital N go to infinity, and uh, a goal is the uniform asymptotic description for all z in the plane. Um, and he, these are the, the applications. I wrote down the, the applications thinking of the discrete case. So, so what I'll spend most of the time talking about is discrete orthogonal polynomials. And so, well, the first application is not discrete. It's random matrix theory. Um, and you can compute the asymptotics of any statistical quantities in sight for unitary invariant ensembles uh, using orthogonal polynomials. And then uh, the rest of the examples are really, um, I guess they're, they're either discrete orthogonal polynomial applications or, um, or uh, uh, you know, orthogonal polynomials on, the, on a curve in the plane, okay? Now, uh, so we're thinking about them as, as generating ensembles of random variables. So, so you think that lambda, which is a vector up there, uh, one, lambda 1 through lambda n, is um, either it's, it's living in the real axis or the individual entries are living in this uh, node set. And in the case that you're living in the real axis, lambda has a probability density given by uh, this formula there, and we've encountered that uh, uh, a lot uh, today and yesterday, so I won't s speak too much about that. In the discrete case, here's the uh, probabilistic interpretation. The, the probability that there are particles at locations x1 up through xk is given by this formula here. Um, and the x1 through xk have to be in this, uh, in this collection of node points, OK? k should be less than capital N, so that <laughs> it makes, <laughs> makes sense, OK? Um, and the, the typical behavior, the typical question is to ask, what's going on when capital N is growing to infinity, uh, k is growing to infinity, and the ratio is going to a constant c? 
which is less than 1. If c were to equal 1, then you know, you'd, it wouldn't be random. You'd, all the particles would be sitting in all of the, the node sites, and there'd be nothing random going on. Um, and uh, with, yes, OK. So this is just a, up there is a repeat of what I had on the previous slide. The, the probability that there are particles at the sites x1 through xk is given by this formula. Um, and n is soon to be grown to infinity. And the, the weights, so on the two, two or three slides ago, I wrote down an orthogonal polynomial, discrete orthogonal polynomial here. And, and I had these weights, which should have been wn comma m, OK? The m goes with the node. So each node has a weight, OK? If you have uh, the, all of these weights at the nodes, then you can really think of it as a function w of x, where x is living on the nodes. And you have to pick, given an x in the nodes, you find the j corresponding to x. And that's <laughs> how you define the weight function. OK? Um, OK. If there are k particles at these locations, and I've got a total of n nodes, then there are n minus k holes at the complementary nodes. And I guess I labeled those y1 through uh, y sub n minus k. And um, so that gives me x1 through xk and all the rest of the locations. This has to be the entire collection of possible nodes. And the reason I'm saying that is because, um, oops, I'm moving too fast. You can also ask, what's the probability that there are n minus k holes at these locations? Of course, it's got to be the same thing as that probability. But there, you can rewrite the formula in this way, where now instead of thinking of the, the locations of the x's, you can write down a probability measure using the locations of the y's. And uh, that k bar means n minus k. <clears throat> and um, that k bar means n minus k. And you have a different weight function. So this weight w bar is, is related to the old weight by this formula here. Okay. So there's really, there's particles and there's holes. And, and those, are, those are two collections of um, particles. And they're dual to each other for obvious reasons. Okay. Uh, so a s simple example of what, um, of what kind of questions you might ask. The product of what two things is one? There are probabilities of finding the, the holes at y1, yk, or finding particles at the complementary. No, the, the two probabilities are equal. Right, they're equal. Yeah. Um, so the, the first thing you might ask about is the, this random variable at the top of the screen. I should use the, the laser to point at it there. Okay. Um, the number of particles that are less than x. So that's a random variable. You can compute its average. Um, sorry, it's a fraction of particles less than x. And that is represented as an integral in the case of like random matrix theory um, of a density function rho 1, which is written there in terms of orthogonal polynomials. So rho 1 is this function kn of xx. And the function kn is a function of two variables. It's called the reproducing kernel. And it's written there um, to sum over the first n n minus 1 uh, orthogonal polynomials. It's a projection kernel onto the first n um, polynomials, OK, times the weight function. In the discrete case, um, what you have instead is a, is a sum instead of an integral. But the function rho 1 that you're computing the sum of is, is built in the same way. It's, it's a function k n k of xx. And k n k is this finite sum over the orthogonal polynomials. The sum stops at at uh, k minus 1. Um, and that is, right, so you're thinking I have a, a collection of k particles living on n nodes. And they can, they can um, you know, dance around. And you want to compute their statistics. And that's the formula for it, OK? So you need to use the, um, the orthogonal polynomials up to degree k, or degree k minus 1. Good? And uh, as, as I pointed out before, um, or maybe I said it and didn't explain it, but a lot of statistical properties can be expressed in terms of the orthogonal polynomials. So, so the first, the, uh, this is a, a slight generalization of what I wrote before, but it's basically the average of 
1 over n times the sum of functions evaluated at the eigenvalues of a random matrix can be expressed as the integral of f times rho 1. And if you're in the discrete case, it's this sum. Right? So that's pretty, uh, that's, uh, pretty cool. And then the variance of the same random variable is um, expressed in this way, again, all in terms of the orthogonal polynomials. Um, if you're in the discrete case, the integrals are just sums, OK? And if you ask for the probability of having no eigenvalues in an interval a, b, it's a Fred Holm determinant of uh, 1 minus uh, kn, calligraphic k, subscript n. <laughs> and, and that is, uh, oops, that is um, uh, an integral operator whose kernel is uh, kn, but it's restricted to the interval a, b. And the only place where a, b appear on the right-hand side is that you're, you're dealing with an operator on the interval a, b. OK? And again, if you're in the discrete case, it's an it's a, it's a operator on little l2, and it's a sum instead of an integral. Yeah, Guillermo. Yeah. Yeah, it depends on the, the problem at hand. But you'll, um, so you look at the equilibrium measure. And if the equilibrium measure achieves an upper constraint, then it's actually easier to look at the dual polynomials because there's no upper constraint achieved. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah, whichever equilibrium measure looks simpler, you use that one. But I'll, I'll show you an example, or uh, this uh, it's kind of a grotesque example, but you'll see, you'll see what I mean. OK? Yeah, it's advantageous to find the one for which you need to do fewer um, uh, machinations. Uh, OK? So the, the first application, we, OK, I'll go through this quickly, but we've heard a lot about this. But the first application of, of like orthogonal polynomial ensembles is um, uh, unitary invariant or the unitary ensemble of random matrices. So, so that means that the matrix entries aren't independent, and I must use uh, a measure more or less like this. You start with a measure on matrices, but I've written it down already on the eigenvalues. And, um, the very first thing that you have to do if you're going to if you're going to compute anything is understand the equilibrium measure, and so here's the first. Uh, it's a it's a well known fact that this density the mean the average density of eigenvalues converges to a um, a function psi, um, and it's a uh, it's actually the density of a probability measure, and the the function psi solves a well known variational problem. I pose it here in terms of a uh, in, over the space of probability measures, you try to find the maximum of this functional. Okay. Um, now, if if v is convex, then you know that the support of this, the measure that achieves this, is a, a single interval. Um, and if if v is not convex, then then all hell can break loose. But if if you know that v is real analytic with suitable growth at infinity, then the this um, the density of the equilibrium measure is supported on finitely many intervals, and it's analytic on the interior of each one. Um, I, I think it, it would be interesting, although nobody has has uh, I, I don't think anyone knows how to do it quite yet. But it would be great to to compute the asymptotic behavior or identify interesting phenomena if you have really um, an infinite gap situation somewhere. But, but that requires, you know, you build a special example where that's going to happen. And that, that it would, would be cool, I guess, is the way to say it. Okay. Um, now, a more refined, a more detailed asymptotic result, so, so is, um, well, so what asymptotic, I'm referring to this one, right? This result here is asymptotic in N. A more detailed result is this, um, oops is this version of universality. So you pick any A in the support of your equilibrium measure. So there's a point A. This is supposed to be the equilibrium measure, this curve there. And so psi is positive. Pick A where psi is positive and consider this probability. Probably that no eigenvalues are in the interval A up to uh, okay, S divided by a parameter N times psi of A. So when N goes to infinity, this interval goes to 0. The density is positive. So you know there's going to be a lot of eigenvalues near A. And if you let the interval go to 0, then um, well, so you might expect that there's very few eigenvalues in that small interval. And so you ask for something like the probability that there are no eigenvalues there, you might get an, a non-trivial answer. And, and there is the answer. As, as n goes to infinity, this probability converges to a uh, Fred Holm determinant of another integral operator with the sine, cur <coughs> sine kernel, which we encountered um, in, in Alexei's talks. 
And um, the, the, the first version of universality is this doesn't depend upon A. And then the second version of universality is that it doesn't depend upon V. And then the, the more recent versions of universality are that it works for Wigner type matrices and even more general things than that. Okay, so um, the f first result of this kind was in 69 uh, by Gaudin and Meta, and then it was um, sort of extended to the case of analytic functions and Lipschitz continuous functions, and then even more esoteric functions by Doron Lubinsky. And in the direction of uh, kind of Wigner matrices and, and, and their, um, their brethren, there's this uh, very fantastic group of people and results there that's only a smattering. But uh, Laszlo showed us a, a table with, which summarized all those results. So, so I will not go through so much detail on that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and then uh, you can also ask about the behavior of the largest eigenvalue. So, so up there at the, is, um, that, was, that was a computationally drawn image of the equilibrium measure in a two-cut case. And that's uh, the, the upper, the sort of the maximum of the support of the equilibrium measure is beta. And so it's easy to, to convince yourself that this is true. The probability that lambda n minus beta absolute value is bigger than epsilon goes to zero when n goes to infinity. And um, the more refined result is up there. So you rescale by an n to the 2 thirds, and this distribution function converges. First statement, it converges. Second statement, it's describable in terms of the, the panel of A2 transcendent. And that was established by, um, well, Forrester and Tracy Whittem. Uh, Forrester, I, I guess, established the limit uh, existed, and uh, Harold and Craig figured out um, this powerful connection to um, integrable systems. Yeah? Where? In, in this picture here? Yeah. You mean I, I might have chosen a V which goes to, to the wrong infinity? Yeah, well, no, I mean, if V. There might be an, like a, there might be an outlier. What, what is it called that you call that? Yeah, you're, that's true. So this is a, yeah, sorry, think like that. I, I, when, I, when I said clear, I meant, oh, I'm thinking of the best possible case where, where basically the, there's no variational equality outside of this support set. Thanks, Elise. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, and this, this, too, has been uh, generalized to crazy examples like, um, the, the, the V is Lipschitz continuous and, and convex. <laughs> you need convexity for that. Um, okay. Uh, so I was just summarizing that. The, the, uh, the second application is sort of random tilings, and so I'll spend a little bit of time going through uh, some, some examples of, an example of random tilings. Um, and that's where you get, uh, you're describing things in terms of discrete orthogonal polynomials. And so here is a hexagon. Um, side lengths are A, B, and C, and inscribed within it is a triangular lattice. Um, if you, if you, uh, so everyone can see that, right? If you, if you glue together um, rhombi along uh, either, you know, that way or what, that way or that way, you get three different types of rhombi, and, and um, They've been named horizontal rhombi here, these two, <laughs> and that's called the vertical rhombus. <laughs> uh, so you can ask questions like how many tilings are there? Um, and, and there's a formula for that. That's the formula for the number of tilings that there are given parameters A, B, and C. And maybe an interesting question is to study the limiting statistics of the tilings when the size of the hexagon goes to infinity. So that's a, I'm just, choosing one particular asymptotic problem to, to study, where A, B, and C scale like a parameter n, and alpha, beta, and gamma are positive constants. Um, so three examples, I, I, I guess I have to do that. Um, uh, amazing, near this, this corner up here, all of the tiles seem to be green with the same orientation, and oh, that's true of this tiling and, and that tiling, 
And it turns out that as the, the hexagon gets larger and larger, that occurs with overwhelming probability. Um, and you, one uh, typically enjoys this picture where, okay, that's supposed to be sampled at random, and every single time you sample one of these with overwhelming probability, you see a picture like this, where there's this temperate region in the middle, and then there's a frozen region near the boundaries, um, and uh, a boundary between them, which is apparently fluctuating from one uh, realization to the next. Um, and I've labeled then the, the you draw a vertical line, and I've labeled the place where that vertical line uh, enters the frozen region. That's called um, either C or X top. Study, uh, problem study fluctuations of that point on that line as the hexagon size goes to infinity. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I, I forget why that's there, but let me just skip it. Okay. So, so here's, here is a picture, and um, it, it's an amazing fact that, I, that we learned from Kurt Johansson that, um, uh, okay, if I draw a vertical line right, right along this, this uh, place where the, <laughs> the middle of the, the location of any uh, vertical rhombi, then I can um, put white dots at the bases of the vertical rhombi and black dots at all the other grid locations. And what I find is um, a collection of uh, holes, which are the white dots, and particles, which are the black dots. Okay? And you pick two different realizations, two different random tilings, but choose the same line, you will always get, on, along this line, you will always get the same number of holes and the same number of particles. Their locations, of course, are not the same, and they're really a random configuration if you think that you have a collection of all possible random tilings and they're equally weighted. Okay? And so, um, by selecting tilings at random and fixing this line, you're really, you can really think I'm looking at particles and holes, and, and one might like to study the statistics of the um, uh, distribution of the particles or the statistics of the distribution of the holes. Okay? And there, uh, a formula is on the top of the screen then that, that explains that the, the probability of finding, uh, I forgot which, the tilde means which thing. Particles. Particles at locations x1 through xc is given by this uh, formula here where so clearly it is um, a, a an orthogonal polynomial ensemble that happens to be discrete with a finite number of nodes. And the num number of nodes is going to grow as, uh, as the size of your hexagon goes to infinity. And th this... Uh, this weight is actually classical, so these polynomials, are, they, they have, uh, they're referred to as Hahn orthogonal polynomials. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, so for, um, maybe it wasn't exactly because of this, uh, we, we, uh, uh, Jinho and Peter and Thomas and I were interested in, ortho in discrete orthogonal polynomials more or less because it was there. Um, and we began working on the asymptotic behavior of discrete orthogonal polynomials and then learned about that connection. Okay. So um, this is... This, this slide shows the Riemann-Hilbert problem and its solution in the continuous case. So for orthogonal polynomials on the real line that might come from random matrix theory, okay? Uh, so capital Y is a matrix. The first column contains the polynomials of degree J and J minus 1 um, with crazy normalization factors in the second entry. And um, in the, the first entry, that's actually just to make it so that the uh, leading coefficient is 1 times z to the j, okay? And then in the second column, you have basically the Cauchy transform of the first column times this weight function, e to the negative nv. And um, 
Well, so the Cauchy transform satisfies boundary value relationships, and so you, you can summarize, um, well, you can characterize this matrix through these three conditions. You have a matrix valued function, the entries are analytic um, in the upper and lower half plane. It behaves in this way as z goes to infinity, so identity plus a correction term times uh, this matrix, z to the j, 0, 0, z to the minus j. And then on the real axis, it has good boundary values, and the boundary values from above and below are not the same, y plus being the boundary value from above, y minus from below, and they're related by what's called a jump relationship, and this matrix is called the jump matrix. Okay. Um, so the three things there, they, um, one, two, and three represent a problem, find y, and it's, it's right there. <laughs> okay? That's the Riemann-Hilbert problem that characterizes orthogonal polynomials, and the solution is at the top, and so when you start computing asymptotic behavior of the, Riem of the solution of the Riemann-Hilbert problem, you extract information about the orthogonal polynomials. So in the discrete case, um, this is the, it's a meromorphic Riemann-Hilbert problem um, at the bottom of the screen, and the solution is this at the top of the screen. It's really the same thing, except the integral is replaced by a sum. Okay, so that's the solution of this meromorphic Riemann-Hilbert problem, and what you have is, it's a function, okay, I wrote analytic in C take away R. It's actually meromorphic in C take away R. It has poles at the nodes, and the you can characterize the poles by saying that the residue at each node is given by the right-hand side of this equation. And if you read that, um, it implicitly is saying the first column has no residues. Um, and I didn't write it carefully, but it's simple poles. And so if, the, if it has no residues, there's the, the first column is entire. And then the second column, um, the, the residues are, are um, a multiple of the first column evaluated at the node, and so if you look up at the top, you see, oh, at each, yeah, that should, z should be, forgot to change the denominator of, of my sum. So that should be, uh, just so you can see it, the denominator up there should be um, x n l minus z. Second column? Doesn't matter? Yeah, the, the right-hand side never uses the second column. It just says that the, pole, the, the poles of the second column are obtained by multiples of the first column times the weight. So that, yeah, I'm sorry about that. That should say uh, XNL minus Z and XNL minus Z. So there's a pole at each XNL. Okay, um, so on the left is the meromorphic Riemann-Hilbert problem, and on the right are these uh, standing assumptions that, that we made in, in our uh, work on discrete orthogonal polynomials, and um, so he here they are. So there is a finite number of nodes, right? It's a discrete orthogonal polynomial system in which there's nodes that go from uh, 0 to n minus 1. Okay, and, and capital N is fixed but getting large. Um, and they're, they're described by a density function rho zero of x, and the nodes are actually defined through this formula right here. So you integrate from A up to xj, the density rho, and you choose the xj so that this integral equals uh, 2j plus 1 over 2n. And, and that, you know, because rho is assumed to be analytic, that gives you a very regular and positive. It's to give you a very regular distribution of nodes. Um, so one point to make is that if you have an infinite number of nodes, then the work that we did doesn't apply directly, and you have to do more, more um, well, gymnastics to make it work. And so, so the, the work that we've done does not include cases where there's infinitely many nodes such as the Meixner or Charlier examples. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, the weights 
are defined in this kind of sick way. It's got an e to the negative n v that's natural. And then uh, these terms, this product here and this negative one to the n, uh, those we included because um, the weight and the dual weight, it's useful if they, are, if they look the same. And so we put this extra disgusting product factor there so that both weight and dual weight had the same <laughs> factor. <laughs> okay, but so the, the product is not essential, but, but we, anyway, it's there, sadly. Um, so I, I'm, I promised myself I wouldn't go through a Riemann-Hilbert analysis. So I just have one little picture to show you the, the first step, okay? So if you look at the formula that appears there on the left, um, I'm taking the matrix Y, which has poles, okay? And I'm not doing anything to the first column of Y, right? I'm multiplying by an upper triangular matrix that doesn't touch the first column of Y. And the second column, um, what I'm doing and then in the second column of R is I'm combining Y and the first column of Y, right? I'm combining the second column of Y plus that sick factor times the first column of Y. The sick factor has poles and they cancel the, the poles that appear in, this, in, y, in the second column of Y, okay? And that, uh, so do it one way in the upper half plane and then another way in the lower half plane, okay? So, so this term, because I'm assuming that row zero is analytic, this term is a nice analytic function in the, in the uh, upper half plane, and I use a different sign down below, e to the negative i pi, a, pi times this integral down below, and um, they just happen to hit exactly the right number, um, a constant, a, a what's two times pi times an integer, at the nodes so they don't affect the pole. <laughs> so, so for any, whether I choose plus or minus, the poles have been eliminated and R is actually a uh, function that, that has uh, no poles left. It still has a jump on the real axis because of that exponential factor out in front, but it has no poles. And so you wind up with the Riemann-Hilbert problem on uh, those three contours with no poles and then the game is afoot. You just you know, um, if, if you like that sort of thing, you might start doing, doing the, the, the rest of the steps in the asymptotic analysis of Riemann-Hilbert problems, um, which I won't go through, okay? Um, but here's a picture of a, a can, an example of an equilibrium measure. And so the, you know, the first thing you have to do in, in, this, in this sort of analysis is you, is you seek the equilibrium measure, which is a probability measure that minimizes this functional. Okay, I changed the sign, and earlier I had a negative sign here, and this was in the numerator, but you try to, and I was maximizing, but now you try to minimize this functional. Um, and the discreteness has, a, has an effect, so it's, you, you minimize this subject to the constraint that the, all measures are actually bounded. So they're, okay, positive, but they're a probability measure, so I don't need to really talk about that, but on this side, the, all of the measures that you consider have to be bounded from above by the density of nodes, okay, rescaled because you only have k particles, not n particles. Yeah, phi is v minus that, the term from the product. But think it's just the external field, okay? So then in, um, so in, you know, in the asymptotics of discrete orthogonal polynomials and the asymptotics of um, things like the continuum limit of the total lattice, uh, this upper constraint is, is, uh, is a, it's, it's both a, a blessing and a curse because, all right, you know, it's bounded, so which that <laughs> helps with the analysis a lot. If it's bounded from above, you're easier to, to prove existence and stuff. But on the other hand, you can have, so here's a picture, the solid curve is the, uh, the density of the equilibrium measure, and the, 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 there's a dotted curve, which is the upper constraint, rho zero divided by x, and you don't see the dotted curve sometimes because the upper constraint is achieved by the equilibrium measure. All right, so, so this is a region where the, where the equilibrium measure hits the upper constraint, and here is a place, okay, where the 
the equilibrium measure is like um, not neither zero nor hitting the upper constraint, and it typically vanishes at those places like a square root, and then it comes back at the upper constraint, and then okay, it goes all the way down, hits zero. <laughs> and so this is a, we we picked a, uh, an example that was quite grotesque, but that's the kind of the typical behavior you would expect. Places where the constraint is active, um, and places where the, where the where you hit that the equilibrium measure is zero, where you don't expect to find any particles. Okay, and then um, separated by places where the where the equilibrium measure is sort of freely determined by the energy constraints, um, and there's a lot of uh, p interesting potential theory. So so you know you could wonder, you could wonder, d does it happen ever that that your equilibrium measure jumps from the upper constraint to zero? And and it's, the answer is not unless something really sick happens. So if you have a nice analytic external field and a nice analytic upper constraint then in order to jump from one to the other, there has to be a band where, where you have, um, you know, it, it can't have a discontinuity. That's all I'm, what I'm trying to say. Okay. Uh, if you, in order to have a finite number of sort of, Okay, this is a weird, it's, uh, sorry, it's going to take me a second to say it right. So if I have, a, if I, I, I should consider both the, the measure and the dual measure. So if I want to know that the measure has finitely many places where the constraints upper and lower are active and finitely many places where it's not, and the same thing is true of the dual, then I need everything analytic. And there's no results other than that that I know of. Except probably convexity would, would, would give you everything in sight, but... but um, you need analyticity to get to rule out infinite infinite gap situations. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. But I, I, I couldn't do it off the top of my head right now, but, but yeah, there's, yeah. yeah. Yeah, like upper constraints really become lower constraints, and lower constraints become upper constraints. It just flips, you just flip it. I mean, the, the, the reason is because you have, there, there are holes in particles, and the, the, the union of them is the entire node set, right? So, so if, you're, if, if, you, if you know your particles are, are doing this, then the holes have to be doing the opposite, <laughs> okay? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, if you think intuitively, what this means is that every node, th there, is a, there is a zero of the orthogonal polynomials n right next to each node, okay? And uh, that means that the, for the dual, there's no zeros near, that, near those nodes, okay? So similarly for the dual, there'd be lots of zeros occupying those nodes. Okay, so it's really flipped it, flips it. Yeah, so, you know, you, okay. If you find that you have a situation where one of the constraints is not active, like, like for example, um, I for, okay, you can, you can imagine a case where, where you have the upper constraint active and then there's a free region, but you never hit the lower constraint, right? In that case, it's actually convenient to use the dual, right? Because then you, you just, okay. But this, this, we picked this sort of because it's, okay, maximally nasty. Uh, so I'm just gonna, I'm stating some results. Um, so, so, you, so here's a collection of, of node points up there, right? B, Bn is, uh, 
nodes x n j x n j plus k one x n j plus k two. So the k one, k two up through k sub m minus one, those are all fixed integers. Okay, and these are nodes. Th these are nodes, and you fix them, and um, x n j is going to converge to some value x, and I want to pick that value x to be someplace where neither constraint is active, so someplace in this zone here or someplace where in this zone here, okay? And because these are finite integers, all of these nodes are in, the act, are in this uh, band, active band, okay? And then you can ask the question, um, what is the probability that precisely m particles are living in this set Bn, okay? Asymptotically as n goes to infinity. And, okay, there's a formula for it, 1 over m factorial, uh, that's the number of particles, right? Should be capital M, I guess. Um, no, sorry, m, m, little m. 1 over m factorial, derivative raised to the mth power evaluated at t equals 1 of this Fredholm determinant where s is an integral operator with this kernel, okay? So, it, so now s is still a discrete operator, I think we... In, I think um, Sasha showed it, showed it to us earlier today. It's, uh, as he was telling us, it, it's squashed a little bit depending upon where you are. So this coefficient there is the contribution from the equilibrium measure, the local density of eigenvalues, okay? Um, so... It's capital M, the, 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 the set BN contains capital M nodes. No, capital M doesn't scale. Capital M is fixed. So That's right. Really yeah. Yeah. Built of the discrete sine kernel. Yeah. Okay. So that's sort of local, uh, local universality, right? Um, and then uh, if you look at an edge, so you have to know that the, the, the endpoints are next to a void so that you, you know you're going to have a largest eigenvalue, a largest particle that's allowed to fly around. And so if your endpoint A, the left-hand endpoint of your node set, is adjacent to a void, that's an, you check that with the equilibrium measure, then you can ask for the distribution of the leftmost particle and you get the tracy widom distribution in that, in that case, okay? Um, if the, and similarly for the right-hand endpoint. So, so this picture, the left-hand endpoint is not adjacent to a void. So this example, you would not have tracy widom for the particles there. But the right-hand endpoint is adjacent to a void and so the largest um, particle is going to fluctuate around here and the fluctuations will be given by the tracy widom law. Okay. okay. There are constants which are defined up there, but I won't, I won't uh, annoy you with that. But there's also the, the um, tracy widom distribution for the location of the leftmost and rightmost holes. So if, if you're, um, if A is adjacent to a saturated region, as it is in this picture here, then the distribution of the leftmost whole is also given by the tracy widom law, okay? And that's a case where you, you go to the dual to prove that. Um, and so if you go back and apply that to the random tiling problem up there, you see, um, so C star is the, the location of the, where the, uh, the random boundary hits the vertical line, and N beta is supposed to be the, uh, the intersection of the Arctic Circle with the vertical line, and the probability under correct rescaling converges to the tracy widom law. Okay? So, interesting directions. So, what I described was really sort of an optimal situation regarding the nodes and the external field. If the, if the, um, if the, if the, uh, if the nodes are not so regular, so for example, uh, the case of Q orthogonal polynomials, the, the node set is, is drastically different than the types of nodes that we considered. And, 
and you know, it's kind of would be great to work out the asymptotic behavior of, of orthogonal polynomials that were sort of Q, like the Q Raka polynomials or something like that. Um, or even if you just said, okay, I want, I want to consider a case when there are infinitely many nodes, right? Uh, Pavel Blecher and Karl Lichty considered uh, that situation, and in order to apply it to the six vertex model, um, couple of the parameter regimes they needed, uh, discrete orthogonal polynomials, the weight was e to the negative uh, x squared, and x was on the integers. So doubly infinite si situation. Um, okay, if the node density vanishes at the endpoints, that is, that is a case where the, um, you're going to have uh, active upper constraints at the endpoints, and so that's an interesting case to consider that hasn't been and worked out. We assumed the node density was positive up to and including the endpoints. Um, okay, and then um, a last thing is if you if you take uh, the GUE beta, so that's I wrote L of zero because we're, we we uh, might think of that as initial data for the total lattice, uh, but the diagonal entries that I wrote there are. Um, independent normally distributed random variables, and the chi's that appear off diagonal are a chi random variable with parameter k, and it's known that the, the uh, everything is known about this example, the, the eigenvalue distribution is exactly GUE beta, and the, um, you even know a lot about the eigenvector distribution. And here's a, an interesting um, observation, so the, the quantity PL of lambda is defined by the what, what I wrote there, VL plus 1 divided by VL. Um, the VL plus 1, those are the, the elements of the eigenvector with eigenvalue lambda. So that ratio is, is a discrete orthogonal polynomial with respect to a random measure that's generated by that, by that um, Jacobi matrix. And well, it would be very interesting to understand something about asymptotics of those discrete and random orthogonal polynomials. Thanks.